going on, man? It's about 4.30 in the morning. Of course, you know, my name is Darren Long. And uh, what will this video right here be about? It's about people uh, trying to be me. In, in a strange and in, in strange way, you know, I got to a discussion on Facebook, you know, a couple weeks ago with some guy who is either a property manager or is a leasing agent on some property here in Atlanta. And they're telling me how I had to be, well, they're telling me how that company had to fire some security uh, because those people are trying to act like me. And, you know, I was trying to figure out how those people are trying to act like me since, uh, Nobody knows what I was doing. And really, what do you mean like that? You know, uh, they get into arguments with people. They're trying to do this. They're trying to do that. You know, uh, okay, how are they trying to act like me? What was their goal? What was their purpose? Do you know? Because really, do you know what I was doing? Uh, how are you going to try to be like me if you don't understand everything that I was doing? Uh, you know, so let's talk about uh, uh, Come See Me Mitch. Where you know I got a bunch of uh, older older people trying to intimidate me. Let's 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 talk about that. Well, you know, hold on. Let me give you a little bit more perspective here. Um, okay, so in, in January twenty fifth, two thousand twelve, I was hired by security by a security company to work at the Metro Mall. Oddly enough, the security company was based in Detroit, Michigan, where. I had recently moved my mother from the Metro Detroit area. So I had been up in Detroit, back and forth between Atlanta, Georgia, but mostly in Detroit, you know, and I was doing security up there. And uh, it was quite a different place in the Metro Detroit area, Metro Atlanta area. But definitely within the city limits of Detroit, definitely different. Because I tell anyone, Detroit police don't show up until a body hit the ground. You know, real serious injury or someone's dead. And that's not an exaggeration. I don't know what it is like now, but back then, that's definitely not an exaggeration. They did not show up until somebody was dead. I mean, that's just the way it was. So, uh, I had that kind of mentality when I came down. But see, now I'm security. And I'm kind of like the guy who you say, listen, don't let someone do this. Okay, you may be thinking... Uh, what's worth it and what's not, what's reasonable and what's not. What I heard was, don't let anybody do this. And when you tell someone like me, don't let anybody do this, then it doesn't become an issue of whether it's worth it or not. I'm simply not going to let you do it. So anyway, I'm working for nine bucks an hour. Uh, I'm working overtime and I'm not getting paid for overtime. And uh, you can't go to the federal government about that if the company's too small and the states won't be interested in that. Uh, you're going to have to actually take them to small claims court. And you can win, but there's no guarantee you collect it. But that's a whole other issue. Uh, in any event, <clears throat> I told the people when I came on is that I will get rid of the problem. I won't manage the problem. Now, why do I want to get rid of the problem? Well, because I want to work my, I want to make my, my workload less. Um... I mean, that's really why I want to get rid of the problem, because I want to make my workload less. I don't want to have to deal with that kind of nonsense every day. And you're not paying me enough to manage the problem. You're only paying me enough to get rid of the problem. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, now, uh, with that said, and that kind of inflexibility, you know, if I got people trying to intimidate me, then I'm going to press them and test them. I'm going to see what they're about. Are you about it? What's going on? Now, for that particular environment also, you know, the police are kind of indifferent about some things. They're kind of an obstacle to some things. And that's what they were when I first got there. Make no mistake about it. If, if we go back, and I, I mentioned, you know, on the third day again, I mentioned this again on the third day that I tried to see T25 people. And, and an officer came out and said, I can't do that. And, you know, he's kind of pressing and testing me too. You know, he's trying to figure out what I'm about as well. And he's trying to figure out what I know and what I don't know. Well, I only made concessions when I had to. And while I knew the law was on my side, and I knew I could do what I could do, I still got to deal with the people I got to deal with. Not only the knuckleheads on the street, but the police as well. Well, that officer brought in a supervisor. And that supervisor 
you know, apparently they had heard, and that supervisor wasn't from the underground precinct, that supervisor had heard about me, you know, having to deal with, you know, Fred and, and Beyond, and the way Fred was treating Beyond, and actually, uh, there's a video of that, you know, online, if you look in the Fred playlist, Fred, Fred, and more Fred playlist, uh, and so, I remember the five officers standing in front of me, and I, I kind of thought of that episode of The Shield, where, you know, there was a new cop that came into the barn, and was going to be a part of this team, and you had five guys standing there trying to evaluate him, and that's what the police were trying to do. And then I had one officer try to intimidate me to tell me that, well, if you do something wrong, we'll arrest you. So, you know, he's trying to slow me down, but, you know, I ain't stunting him because I know what I know. Now, I will admit to being disorderly. I was definitely disorderly, so I will admit to my disorderly conduct. But everything else I did, yeah, we, we were kind of within the law. Really, but but in any event, you you still got to judge the officers that you're with, and how you gonna know what I was doing if you don't know the environment? I mean that one particular environment. You know, my the officers that came to deal with me not like might not be like the officers that come to deal with you, so you can't do what I did. So, in any event, if you try to intimidate me, I'm gonna press you and test you to see what's up. It has two folks. I'm gonna see where you're standing. We we'll see how serious you are about it. And also, by definition, police officers are public safety officers. Now, if they don't ignore their duty, if they do not ignore their duty, they cannot allow that to happen. So what happens is when you have the more potential for violence, you should have more police in the area. Okay, there's, there's a lot of stuff jumping off here. Maybe we need to get some more officers down there. And that's what I was looking for, too. So when you escalate certain situations, if the police are aware of this, and believe me, the police have been aware of a great number of things. Now, unfortunately, video for February and, and uh, the beginning of March, most of that, that video I lost because a hard drive crashed. But before I got a taser, all I had was a gun. And on Broad Street, especially on Broad Street, it didn't happen on Peace Street. You know, if the guys were selling drugs outside the, outside the, uh, uh, my back door, and I came out the back door and got at him, and we got into some kind of uh, uh, verbal confrontation, and people started to surround me, I didn't have a taser. All I had was a firearm. That gun came out the holster, trust me. That gun came out the holster. Either low and ready, or more, more than likely high and ready. Right? Uh, and the police were... Police were fully aware of that. They were fully aware that that gun came out the holster. Yeah, I mean, I feel threatened for my safety, so yeah, that gun comes out the holster. <clears throat> and if you want to prosecute me on that, or you want to charge me on that and try to prosecute me on that, feel free. Because I'm not playing. You know, I can go out there and do what I did. They's out there selling drugs at my back door. I can go out there and challenge them and say something about it. And if I wanted to, and actually, by the state of Georgia, I can arrest them. Now, you have to determine whether or not you want to take on that criminal liability and that civil liability, right? You have to do that, you know? And that's that's decision for anyone to make. But still, once you start to surround me, and I got, you know, I'm dealing with two or three or four people here, and I got people trying to get behind me and this and that and the other. Oh, no, player. We not, I'm talking milliseconds or tens of seconds, really. So... If it takes two tenths of a second to have that weapon clear your holster and put it into action, you know, if that, that weapon's already out the holster and it's high and ready, you know, that's two or three tenths of a second that, you know, you that's going to work in your favor. You don't have to, to respond to that like that. You know, the gun is already in your hand and up here by your chest. So there, there's, there's no response time. The response time is less than any kind of stimulus. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not playing out here. So what you have with somebody with a different mentality than what they were used to, they were used to being able to intimidate people. They were depending and counting on people thinking, well, this is not worth it, and this is this, and this is that, and the other. And I wasn't that person. So they couldn't depend on that. And, and Rick at one time had said, uh, uh, you know, these guys don't know what to do with you. They, they never met anyone like you. They never met anyone with that kind of technology. I mean, you're walking around with cameras and, and uh, they never, 
they never met anyone who who knew knew about the law. I mean, people say they know about the law and really don't know nothing, but you know, you, you know something and you go right up to the edge, but you don't cross the line. And so the knuckleheads didn't know what to do with you, and the police just, you know, kind of don't know what to do with you. And so instead of fighting you, you know, they'll kind of work with you, and and that's what eventually ended up happening to some degree. So when people call me a vigilante and and, and I sent them videos, and, you know. Come on, vigilante don't constantly, for the lack of a better phrase, court the police to get them to intervene <clears throat> like I did. I mean, I don't, I don't consider that a vigilante. Now, like I said, the police when I first got there were more of a, an impedance than they were an assistance. But it, in any event, <clears throat> you know, you can't be me if you don't know what I was doing. You can't be me in that situ in, in your situation because you don't know what I would do in that situation. I mean, first of all, you can't exceed policy. If you exceed policy, then what happens is you, you're going to hang yourself out to dry. You know, uh, if you get into a situation and, and people look at the policy, well, what was his job at this, this particular site? And they say you can't put your hands on people. They say you need to back up and just call the police. And you get into an argument, you put your hands on somebody, then you're outside of policy and now you got, you know, more problems than you would have uh, when you go to court because then you can't even say that you were them policy. So let's talk about that, that incident where old dude got a, a, a just died in New York City. And I'm, I'm only going to say very little about it. You know, he resisted arrest because he snatched his arms away. I think his name is Eric Gardner. He resisted arrest. He snatched his arms away. Uh, the police officers uh, took him into custody. A part of taking him into custody, they put him in a chokehold. Now, all the other stuff was standing. The first question I had was, were they within policy? Because if that guy was not in policy, then he's got a problem. If he, if he was within policy, then maybe NYPD has a problem. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm, not going any further than that when it comes to Eric Garvey. Just, you know, are you within policy? If you're within policy, you got a little protection, not much. You got a little bit of an argument, really no protection, but a little bit of an argument saying, you know, I was within policy. You know, this is what they told me to do. If you're, in the, if you're outside of policy, <clears throat> then you don't really have an argument. Because, you know, the first thing the prosecution is going to say is that you were, not, you were out of policy. And once again, you don't know what my policies were and, 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 and what was going on and what I was dealing with. So, hey, you can't be me. Don't try to be me if you don't understand what the hell I was doing. Also, um, you know, just, just a little more background information, and it's really important. Um, my security company that was based in Detroit didn't want daily reports, weekly reports, activity reports, or incident reports. They didn't want any of that. And I had been on the phone talking to them and saying, listen, there's a problem out here. You know, one, I'm one man doing the job, and there should be two people out here doing this job, but there was no money for it. Um, and two, it's not if we get into a, 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 a violent interaction, it's when. It's not if, it's when. It's actually when it's going to happen. Because I'm not backing up, and they're not backing up. So we got a real problem. Uh, and I really didn't get too much of a response for that. So I don't really know what to tell anybody. I mean, you know, you have to know what I was dealing with at the time. You know, people trying to slow me down, the police trying to slow me down, you know, the company saying, you know, maybe you shouldn't do this or that or the other. But they really, I didn't get a, really a whole lot of guidance. And the policy, they didn't have a policy. The policy was, you know, go to work, do the job, and solve the problem. Generally, that's what the policy was. But that policy never got tested because... I ended up becoming the manager. The, the Trinity uh, ended up hiring me directly away from the security company so I could become the manager to get around some some things that we needed to get around. So, you know, I'm not going to talk about it anymore at that because I think I covered that in the last video. But really, you cannot be me if you do not know what I was doing and why I was doing it. You can't, you can't be me. Hmm. You know, that, that's pretty much it. You cannot be me. 
if you do not know what I was doing, and you don't know why I was doing it, and maybe you don't want to be me, uh, because, you know, it comes with certain drawbacks. You know, uh, the professional security community don't particularly care for me. No one wants to bring that all the all that kind of attention to what they're doing. You know, no no one wants that kind of attention to their to their ratchet environment. You know, later on, you know, it became more about the you know what I was doing. That only came about keeping the metro ball safe and secure, but uh, it also came about uh, the community in general. You know, like this stuff is ridiculous for the whole community and. You know, it's a whole bunch of things. Anyway, uh, that's it.